Welcome back, everyone. The TSA's no-fly list, it's doubled in the past year, now with nearly 21,000 names. But is it making a difference to the terrorists or just the travelers who some believe are getting just hassled? Yeah, a lot of them are. Fox News senior judicial analyst and the host of Freedom Watch, Judge Andrew Napolitano, joins us live. Good morning, guys. It morning. looks as if the no-fly list really blew up, doubled, after that guy tried to blow up his, his pants on that um, jetliner bound for Detroit. Well, you're right, Steve. It looks that way because the numbers have increased, mm -hmm. but because the government will not tell us the standards for putting someone on the no-fly list, we don't know if these are artificially inflated numbers intended to give us the false sense of security or if they really have uh, found bad guys who haven't committed a crime so they can't be uh, arrested or as to whom there's insufficient evidence uh, of that, but who would be dangerous on a plane. Sure. So the 500 Americans, there's 21,000 people on the list, 500 Americans, they don't know who they are. Right. If I go to the airlines, if I go to, to a flight to Washington, D.C., and they say, sorry, you're on the no-fly list, and then I sue the government, the government will tell the judge before whom my case is assigned, we can't tell you why we put them on the list because it's classified information. Uh. So that lets the government be arbitrary but create the false sense of security. Mm -hmm. This is the same mentality that strip searched two 86-year-old wheelchair-bound grandmothers. And then it said they didn't do it and then admitted that they, that they did. Right. But, but my, my, my question to you is, should we, so we shouldn't feel good that there are more people on the list then because you don't believe that actually they're there for the right reason? I don't. But I don't know because the mm -hmm. government won't give us enough information to make a judgment about whether this list uh, is, is a prophylactic or whether it really does keep us safe. We should know who's on the list and we should know why they're on the list. And if someone is on the list who doesn't belong there, they should be able to get off the list. But we can't do any of that. I'm the TSA you. just tells us and we blithely accept it. That's why we're talking about this, Steve. Exactly right. We're trying to Where add is a little Kilmer? sunshine. Is he pizza He's in the Indian Indian football. Football. We're going to go out to him. Uh, <laughs> kind of next. All right, and we'll be watching you tonight over on Fox Business. Thank you, sir. Thank you, guys. All right. So let's take this to the judge now. Fox News Senior Ju Judicial Analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano is here. He's hosted the Freedom Watch over on the Fox Business Network and our main guy on this sort of issue. I, I don't know. What do you do now? There's not very much you can do. You can only hope that Hillary Clinton and, and her team at the State Department can negotiate a deal for the release of these people, as she and her team did for three American students a few weeks ago. She's been mighty impressive. Correct. But there's a limit to what she can accomplish uh, with the use of the carrot and the stick. Now, we give them over a billion dollars a year. She does have the ability to ask the president to hold back some of that money. Does it come all at once? It comes uh, regularly, so she can stop uh, March or April's delivery, March or April's uh, check. Uh, but look at it this way. The American government is a target for the military there, and Americans on the streets of Cairo are fair game because it is popular for the military to target Americans and say that they are engaged in anti Egyptian activity, activity which in the United States is absolutely and totally protected by the First Amendment. So it, it, it's not a fair system at all. The judges work for the government. The government is the military. The military is making up the law as it goes along. It is between two constitutions, the one that was in existence when Hosni Mubarak was the president, the one that will come into existence when a new government is allowed, uh, is, is permitted to be elected. It's a very dangerous time to be there, and there, there is no law except what those in power say is the law. And if we withhold our money, there's the possibility that we don't have any leverage at all now. Correct. Correct. Well, that's where Mrs. Clinton and her team come in. They've got to do this in a judicious way. I mean, their goal is not to save money. Their goal is to get those 19 people out. But, Shep, there'll be another 19 or yeah. another 25 or another 35 after that. Americans are targets for this government in Egypt in these days. Got to stay out of there these days. Apparently so. The judge will be on Freedom Watch on the Fox Business Network weeknights, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock in Oxford, on the Fox Business Network, giving you the power to prosper. It is her job to uphold the Constitution of the United States. So why did Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg have this advice for Egypt as they try to build their own working democracy? I would not look to the U.S. Constitution if I were drafting a constitution in the year 2012. I might look at the Constitution of South Africa. Oh, boy. Judge Andrew Napolitano joins us live. So here she is. She's supposed to interpret the U.S. Constitution. She's supposed to love the U.S. Constitution. And she says, hey, Egypt, if you want to build your own constitution, look to South Africa or Canada. 
Well, South Africa's constitution is very different from ours. We'll start off with size, Steve, as you can see. Okay, there's, he's got a big... Th theirs is an inch and a half thick. Ours is this. Now, this has other documents in it besides the U.S. Constitution, but ours is about three to five pages, whereas this is 160. Because the South African Constitution lists in far greater details all the things that the government is obliged to give you. In the Western world, we believe that our rights come from our humanity, right. and things like food, shelter, clothing, health care, a gym membership are goods mm -hmm. that we can acquire if we work hard. So the South the African Constitution uh, entails your entitlements. Yes, the South African Constitution says if you can't afford food, shelter, clothing, or health care, because you have a right to it, the government will give it to you. One of the things about her is I understand she has said in the past that uh, when she's trying to figure out which way to rule, she sometimes looks at foreign law. Well, shouldn't you be looking at the U.S. Constitution and well, not foreign law? Yes, you should. This is a particularly offensive, re relatively recent trend for Supreme Court justices to look at foreign law. Now, they may have written something down in their laws, which is interesting, but the culture that animated the laws, the manner in which their laws came into existence is so different from ours, it ought to be considered irrelevant. Justice Ginsburg is also of the view that this Constitution is alive. Right. Meaning that it, it's, its interpretation and meaning can change every day. Justice Scalia, on the other hand, says this thing means the same thing today as when it was right. written. That's the whole purpose of it. But she says, no, 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 each generation can interpret it differently. And it almost, in reading her comments, it almost makes it sound like she was going, you know, our Constitution is kind of old. It doesn't really reflect what's going on. But that's the beauty of our Constitution. It is the beauty of our Constitution. There's language it's in here that can adapt right. to the modern era and language that was relevant when it was uh, written. Does she, does she know what she's doing? Well, she knows what she's doing in that she has a, a, a mindset and an attitude about the virtues of big government, and she's going to interpret this in such a way as to let big government uh, flourish. How much longer she's going to do that is really uh, up to her. She's 78 years old. She's a very, very liberal Democrat. She probably wants to leave while a, a like-minded person is in the White House. So I she's gotcha. reading the election returns. All right. Judge Andrew Napolitano, <laughs> check him out over on Fox Business with Freedom Watch each and every night tonight at 8 and then 11 p.m. Eastern. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Judge. But House Homeland Security Subcommittee is taking a close look at who should conduct security screenings at our nation's airports. Just yesterday, the TSA agreed to allow a private company to take over for its agents at one small Montana airport. Some want this done at more airports across the country, arguing it would create jobs, it would save taxpayers money, and also it would just be more efficient. Is it the best move when it comes to safety? Let's bring in our Fox News senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew Napolitano, and we wanted to talk to you about this, yeah. Judge, because it brings up a broader conversation of what role we think the government should have with certain parts of our, of our safety. Well, let me make both arguments for you. One argument is that the, we need the government to monitor the airway, airways and the government controls where the planes fly so they don't collide with each other. The government has the money and the wherewithal to keep bad people from getting on planes and harming us. And they've done so relatively well and without any incidents since 2001. The other argument is uh, the airlines are paying the government for a service that the airlines could do better. Mm -hmm. The airlines have the better, the greater interest in protecting passengers because they're the ones who will suffer the most if something happens. You cannot sue the TSA if they had let a bad guy on, but you can sue the airline and you could certainly sue a private security firm. So which is better in terms of freedom and safety, the government doing this or a private company doing this? And we have an experiment going on. San Francisco, very large and, and uh, busy airport. Port, Big international airport. Correct. Has opted for private security screeners. They look like TSA agents. They wear TSA uniforms, but they are employed by a private vendor. They have TSA supervisors, but the people who touch you and communicate with you are private vendors. It's they do not work for the government. It's interesting to think. I was, it's hard to make a comparison, but I was thinking about our highway system. And if I was driving on the highway, uh, you have the local police or, or the state police that, that can pull you over and enforce the rules. It's not a private company. And in fact, it might be odd if it was a private company that was trying to enforce, you know, DUIs or speeding or something like that. So, how, how, where is maybe the difference where it applies to, to airports 
versus you know what I just gave, or is there a difference? Well, the the difference is that the airlines have the most to lose in the case of a of a catastrophe, and therefore the most to gain from preventing a catastrophe. And would you would you rather go through a security check where the person was pleasant to you and wanted your business and treated you with respect, or the demeaning experience that we all begrudgingly put up with with the TSA now? Uh, if the screeners worked for the airlines, you'd enjoy the experience, and you well, might you even be, be able. To be competitive, you would think that's what they hypothesized. To be competitive, you would have the better screeners, nicer screeners somewhere else. Here's the competition you would have. Some airlines would say we are going to screen you from head to toe if this is what you want to go through. Some would say we're. Going to talk to you like El Al does. We're not necessarily going to touch your body. Others would say, we're going to pre-screen you. If we pre-screen you, you don't have to go through the line at all. There's a lot more to this. I know we're going to catch your show a little later on today. Freedom Watch on the Fox Business Network every weeknight, 8 and 11 p.m. Eastern Time. It's now in the battle over South Carolina's voter ID law. The state now suing the Justice Department after it blocked the law that requires voters to show government-issued photo IDs at the polls. Judge Anna Napolitano, Fox News senior judicial analyst and also the host of Freedom Watch on the Fox Business Network. Good morning to you. Hello, Bill. You've got an issue with this. Well, I do have an issue with it. I mean, this is really a, a bizarre creature in our law, How which come? permits the Attorney General of the United States to invalidate a law that a state has enacted. Normally, if somebody doesn't like a law, they challenge it. You can challenge it in the state courts or you can challenge it in the federal court. But Congress is so desirous of getting its hands into the state's regulation of voting. Remember, the Constitution left the regulation of voting who votes, when they vote, how they vote, to the states. That it has enacted this legislation that permits the Attorney General to invalidate a state's voting law. So South Carolina comes along and says, you know what, we have a problem with people voting. We don't know who they are. We don't know if they've voted in more than one place or even if they're registered. So we want them to produce an ID. Indiana does the same thing. Indiana's ID law is upheld by the Supreme mm. Court of the United States. South Carolina offers and signs the same law. So then riddle me this. I think it's valid in Georgia also. Yes. H how is the law in South Carolina constructed differently than you find in Indiana or Georgia? That's where politics comes in. It is now February. If the Attorney General of the United States can hold up the enforcement of this law beyond, shall we say, November, he might be able to influence the outcome of the voting in South Carolina. So you think there's a delay here? I think that South Carolina believes that, and I think there's evidence for them to believe that. And really? I understand their frustration with a bureaucrat in Washington invalidating a state law. That's not the way the Constitution was written. The Constitution doesn't authorize this, but the elites have gone along yeah, with it. Yeah, I see. So I, again, back to the question, is South Carolina fundamentally different from Indiana and Georgia uh, based on the way the law is set up? No, that's a great question, Bill. The law in South Carolina, the one that Eric Holder yeah. invalidated, is nearly identical to the one that the Supreme Court upheld from Indiana. So that's South Carolina's complaint. Yeah. You know you're going to lose, Mr. Holder, mm -hmm. so why are you doing this to us and why are you doing it now? And what the state said is that you can go to the DMV and get a photo ID. Yes. Yes, you don't, have to, do you don't have to be a driver. You don't have to have a driver's license. By the way, you yeah. can do that in every state in the union. Just walk in, they'll give you a valid government-issued ID, and then you can vote. All right, we'll see how this turns out, and whether it drags out. I, I think it'll can. drag out. I think there'll be a lot more to observe from this one. Thank you, Judge. Catch you later tonight, all right? Pleasure, Freedom Watch on uh, weeknights at 8 o'clock Eastern time. Again, at 11 o'clock Eastern, only on the Fox Business. Well, it's hard. It's very hard to take away someone's basic fundamental, foundational right and think that we wouldn't be upset. It, it's very difficult to affront that. And that's what we're experiencing. That's why the bishops are speaking up so insistently and, and right. so consistently. Uh, my hope is that enough people, and it seems to be the case across the country, uh, across the board, people are saying, this mandate is wrong. All right, Cardinal, thank you very much. Very good. You're very you. welcome. Thank you. Well, forget whether then it's immoral. Judge Andrew Napolitano says what the administration is trying to do here is actually illegal. Explain, Judge. The Cardinal's talking about the uh, Ten Amendments. He's talking about the First Amendment. The first clause, the first sentence of the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of religion or interfering with the free exercise thereof. So Congress cannot interfere with the ordinary religious practices of any faith-based group. 
The Catholic Church has been opposed to a contraception for 400 years. Pope Paul VI affirmed that in a permanent way in 1968. The church is never going to change. The church is never going to change, and the church is well known. The church's position on this is well known. This is not an issue about the morality of contraception. This is an issue about the government interfering with the internal works of an established religious organization by taking money from them because they refuse to follow a law. The church is being fined or will be fined if this isn't changed for not purchasing insurance coverage for its female employees who require, but its male employees who require contraceptive uh, information and, and, uh, and medical advice. Well, could they fulfill the requirement by just directing their people elsewhere? They could fulfill the requirement by leaving those people to follow their own consciences, and they could fulfill the requirement by just giving them health insurance that doesn't cover this. They could fulfill that requirement as a moral obligation to their people, but that will not satisfy the government. The government, which now tells us, A, you must have health insurance, and B, here's the kind of health insurance you must have, is telling every Catholic institution, from something as large as the University of Notre Dame, of which I am a graduate, to as small as St. Margaret Mary Flower Pot Church downtown, with the priest and the janitor and the, and the secretary, that every one of them has to make contraception available to all of their employees, and if they don't, the government will find them, and the government will provide that to the employees. That's what interferes with the free exercise of religion. Would this issue come up with the Supreme Court weighing this whole thing, or is it a, a, a sidelight, or one that would influence the decision, hey, this is getting a bit too interesting? Actually, the, the issues have already been framed before the court, and the briefs have already probably been written, though they haven't been filed, and this is not among them. But so, is it noise that could influence a decision like that? It, it, it is noise that could influence a decision like that because the members of the court are human okay. beings. But they shouldn't. They should just look at the issues before them. Understood. Judge, thank you very much. You're welcome. Uh, a guy who follows all Ten Commandments easily. Oh, and in fact, he, he adds commandments. <laughs> uh, you got to judge on his hit show, Freedom Watch, uh, at 8 p.m. on the Fox Business. The government also putting some of those banks, the same ones, on notice for selling mortgage-backed securities that turned out to be toxic and played really a major role in the financial collapse. According to the reporting of the Wall Street Journal, which is owned by the parent company of this network, the Securities and Exchange Commission is planning to sue the banks for selling the packages of really near worthless mortgages. At issue, did the banks misrepresent the quality of those packages to the investors? Our senior judicial analyst, Judge Andrew DiPolitano, is here. He anchors Freedom Watch over on the Fox Business Network. What about sure. that? Well, this is really um, an unfair shot by the government. Hmm. When the government has charges against a series of individuals or, or entities like these banks, it's supposed to take all the defendants on at the same time and in the same place. So as Melissa just described, the banks coughed up $25 billion. The day after they coughed up the $25 billion, the government says, by the way, we're going to sue you for something else. Would they have coughed up the $25 billion had they known that this lawsuit was coming? The courts are not supposed to be used to wear down a defendant piecemeal with litigation on top of litigation. This is all supposed to be filed at once. The government has a very difficult job ahead of it. It will have to prove to a judge and a jury that these bankers who sold the mortgage-backed securities knew that they were worthless and sold them anyway. That's a very high level of proof. It's five years after the sales. It's going to be a very difficult thing to do. Prediction, the banks will cave, just like they did in the case Melissa was talking about. Mm. The banks cave and then there's some sort of deal. Right, right. That happens all the time. These banks should have some backbone and basically say to the government, see it in court prove your case rather than intimidating this kind of cash out of us. There's this issue of something that I don't know much about, but I know you do, and it's called the entire controversy doctrine. Yes, this basically says that when a plaintiff, the government, has numerous claims against defendants. It has to bring all those claims against all those defendants, if the claims are, are connected, at the same time, in the same courtroom, before the same judge. Wow. So that you don't cough up $25 billion on a Tuesday and then find out on Thursday they want another $25 billion from you. That is exactly what happened here. The government violated this basic principle of fairness, which is the law of the land throughout the whole country. I, I hope you're right. I wonder if you're right, because this is definitely what the industry is anticipating, is that by virtue of caving to this and doing this settlement, it just opens the floodgates. And now the banks become like the tobacco companies. And for years and years, there's just lawsuit after lawsuit where they are forced to cough up money for this and that and the other thing business practices going forward when the it's states a new era melissa's right when the states sued the tobacco companies all those cases were consolidated in one what's called multi-district lit litigation before one judge that's where the seven billion dollars came 
that they coughed up in the tobacco litigation. Which seemed like a lot back then. Yes, it did seem like a lot. No trial. Again, the arm. Joe Biden squeezing on the shoulder. Give us the cash or else. Hmm. Interesting. We'll see how the little guy fares out of all this. Yes, we will. Well, the judge. Thanks. We'll watch for the judge on Freedom Watch on the Fox Business Network. That comes on at 8 o'clock Eastern Time, 7 o'clock in Oxford. Going through airport <laughs> security. We all know it's tedious and time consuming, but maybe not anymore. And it's nothing to laugh at, Judge. Uh, <laughs> the TSA is now expanding a program that lets frequent flyers who voluntarily, pro uh, voluntarily provide personal information zip through security even without taking off their shoes. So what problem do you have with that, Judge Andrew Napolitano? And, and Judge, will this jeopardize anybody's safety? What do you think? You know, I, I think there are good sides to this and bad. The good side is shorter lines. If you're a, a frequent flyer, you give this information to the TSA and you know you can, you can get through and you can bypass that inconvenience. The, the downside of it is the TSA will require of you personal information that the government is not entitled to coerce from you. What do you mean by coercion? Okay, Brian, give us this information about you or we're going to subject you to a pat down. Yeah, but that but wouldn't coerce you because you you're a tough that? guy. Did you but just ask yourself your own question? No, yes, I did. That's what we're here <laughs> for. Wait a minute. What, what, what's, what's any different than, I mean, the government already knows my social security number, which is something that you rarely give out anymore. So Ver what's the difference? It's a very good question. The government has not yet published a list of the personal questions that they're going to ask. So we don't know what they're going to ask. Perhaps I am wrong. Perhaps they're just going to ask what they already know about us. Mm -hmm. But given the way the TSA has operated in the past, it is likely that they will seek from us information to which they are ordinarily not entitled as a condition for letting us pass through. Like what? I mean, obviously, I just bought some tickets last night, and they asked you for the, the names and the ages and the sex. Well, that, uh, and that, then they asked for, like, a, a redress number, which I, I have no idea what that was. What so is I, a redress? That, that's, I, I don't I know. think that is going to be the number that, that you can put in eventually when you're on on this list, I think. All right. Look, if the government asks for things that they already know about or or that are reasonable, mm -hmm. like where are you coming from and where are you going to, things that 10 years ago we might have thought we didn't have to give, but in, in this era we feel comfortable giving anyway because it's so routine, then there won't be any uh, problem with this. <laughs> but my cousin Janet, kidding, of course, about the cousin, uh, has not yet published what these questions will be. Well, when she publishes but, them, then but, we can evaluate them. Let me them. ask you this. Doesn't this fit into what a lot of people were calling for? Yes. Which was more profiling. Yeah. So when it kind of in a reverse way, it's profiling out the people whom they might deem not dangerous. You know, one of the most successful and least intrusive airlines in the world is El Al. Mm -hmm. And their profiling consists of, like this, with Kill Me, looking in his eyes, asking him questions, Five minute interview. not touching him. Right. And then they'll say, Kill Me, let him through. So they, they basically are using intelligence rather than force. Right to decide who gets on the plane. You know, one other thing is the more information you give the government, the more they know about you. And there's a supercomputer with oh, all you're that in my, you're stuff in my wheelhouse in there, now, right? Steve. Yes. Right. <laughs> Look, that's why we have a fourth amendment because there's certain aspects of us the government right. is not entitled to know about no matter what the government's wishes unless they go to a judge and show that there's evidence of crime. Right. I hope so. Try right. telling I, that I, to your local I, TSA. I'm willing, right. to, I'm willing to give up my shoe size if it means I don't have to take them off. What size are those shoes? Seven. I just wish we wouldn't tell everybody that we're making it easier for certain people because yeah. then that will be their focus. That's a very legitimate concern, Thank you, Brian. And I think that that will factor into what these questions are as well. Uh, right. See, he's pretty good at 6.30 in the morning. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's 7 o'clock is my problem. <laughs> what about 8? Yeah, 8 is, eight is no walk Let's in the park go there. <laughs> what about three hours in the windowless oh, radio booth with yeah. him? Yeah. I've, I've, I've been up there. It can be scary. Thank you, Judge. All right, Judge, have Pleasure, a fantastic guys. weekend. You too, my friends.